We, uh, it's a long time we have, uh, we have had a lecture on a single community. I think the last one was about three years ago, at least in this forum, on the Jewish community of New York. And I think it's a good idea to uh, start uh, looking more at individual communities. In fact, we had a seminar on the Jewish community of Memphis a couple of weeks ago, but not in this uh, framework. And as you may see in the invitations which are on the table, the next one is on the uh, Jewish community of New Orleans after Katrina, because it's of course an interesting story, a community which was very heavily, not only physically, but also number-wise, damaged community went down from 10,000 to 7,000. And uh, there has been much rebuilding of the community and efforts to attract people from outside New Orleans to join the community. And uh, it's a very interesting story. I'm very glad that Michael Weil, who from time to time used, when he lived in Jerusalem, used to come to these uh, lectures, will uh, speak here on the third of uh, March on uh, what he has done and what has been done as the, the uh, director of the Federation in Toronto. Uh, Toronto is, of course, an extremely interesting uh, community which over a certain period has grown uh, to by far dominant community in, in Canada and left Montreal, uh, the second community, far behind. And it's one of the very interesting, very, very warm uh, Jewish communities. And uh, I'm very, very happy that uh, that, that Sokolsky, uh, who is the president and the CEO of the UJ Federation of Greater Toronto, for the last five years, that he has been uh, willing to tell us about the uh, position of the community, the position of the Federation, its priorities, its challenges, and, uh, and so on. Third largest community in uh, North America, behind New York and Chicago, and uh, it's a very good occasion to get more insight into Canada, on which, by the way, we have published uh, on Canadian jewelry also since the founder of this institute, late Daniel Lazar, whose picture is up there on the left. We have always extensively published on Canada. That Excuse me, I'm uh, just uh, suffering the ends of a cold and an ear infection, so I have to drink the water and cough a little. Please excuse me. It's been a terrible winter in Canada. I'm coming to the warmth. <laughs> I feel the heat radiating down on me. Um, I am going to speak about the Jewish community of Toronto, and uh, but not just to enlighten you on, on the community, uh, but uh, I'm going to end with um, sort of a proposal that has to do with um, the kind of uh, the changes in, in the uh, what the changes in the Jewish community of Toronto represent um, as they might inform Israel and world Jewry in terms of uh, a changing paradigm for the future of the connection between Israel and world Jewry um, because as I'm about to tell you uh, there have been tremendous changes in Toronto, and um, while they are not unique in the Jewish world, I think they point to a, a fundamental shift in diaspora jury that uh, the people and uh, the government of Israel, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel have to take note of and understand that perhaps this is the future for the Jewish people, this is, a, this is what we have to build upon. Um, the world has changed. Uh, the mass urbanization of the world and the mass urbanization of the Jewish people in the diaspora may mean a fundamental different understanding of uh, what exactly future strategies have to be to connect uh, Israeli Jewry and diaspora Jewry. I'm, I'm delighted to see many, many friends here, particularly honored that uh, Rabbi Marmer is here. Uh, I'm sure he'll keep me in line uh, in terms of... <laughs> My knowledge of Toronto, his knowledge of Toronto is far deeper than mine. Even though I was born and bred in Toronto, um, uh, there, it, it is a vast community and there's many things to know about. 
But having said that, I just want to point out uh, <coughs> the fact that I was born and, and raised in Toronto makes me an, an exception amongst Jewish Federation directors. It's the norm that Federation directors move around, are very mobile, and move from city to city to city to find their finally find their spot. Uh, it's very rare that you find an executive director, particularly in a large federation like Toronto, who moves up literally from the mailroom and uh, to the top of, and not to the top of the federation. And for that, I'm very blessed. Um, just to give you some background for those of you who don't know about the Jewish community of Toronto, it's pretty well doubled in the last 30 years. Uh, we believe the population is around 200,000. Um, from a campaign point of view, we're the third largest federation behind New York and Chicago. From a population, we're about the fifth or sixth largest Jewish population in North America. And uh, what has happened in the last 30 years? Um, again, the story of uh, urbanization of the Jewish community, the story of urbanization of Canada, massive political changes in Quebec that uh, most of you know about, mass immigration from Montreal, um, but to put aside a myth, while there has been tremendous immigration from Montreal, and Montreal Jewry did change the face of Toronto Jewry, um, the largest portion of, of immigrants coming to Toronto have been from small town Ontario. That is, more Jews came from the former <coughs> small communities around Toronto than from Quebec itself. And what you're seeing now, sadly, is the emptying out of small town Jewry right across Canada. Uh, to the to the point where uh, within the next 10 years, 60% of all Jews in Canada will live in Toronto. Um, and by the year 2021, 80% of all growth under from age 0 to 24 of Jews in Canada will be in Toronto. So not only are Jews moving to Toronto, the young generation, 80% of that generation, will eventually be living in Toronto and that will and so the decline in the rest of Canada will be even greater. Um, this is very unusual for Canada in the sense that Canadian jury is not following the pattern of the rest of the country. The rest of the country, there has been a great movement towards the West, growth in communities such as Calgary and Vancouver. Jews aren't, aren't going there. They're not moving West. They are all they're young and Jewish. All roads lead to Toronto. Uh, we have uh, large influxes of Jews from Vancouver and from Calgary, despite the fact that those are economic boom, time, boom towns in, in Canada. Uh, people are choosing, and this is, and I'll speak to later on, speak to this later on. They are choosing to move to Toronto. They are making a Jewish decision as opposed to an economic decision, like, you know, counter to their their other their Canadian patriots. Uh, compatriots. Um, in addition to the vast movement of Montreal Jews and uh, Jews from small town, there's been a huge influx of uh, Russian Jew Russian speaking Jews, South Africans, and in the last 10 years in particular, of uh, Israelis. Now when you, I, I have the good fortune of working with all these three groups and their representatives. If I added up all the totals that they claim of the, of the community, Toronto population would be about, the Jewish population would be about half a million. <laughs> the Russians will tell you we represent 50,000, the Israelis say 50,000. I'm exaggerating too. Uh, my best estimate is that there's probably about uh, 30,000 Russian speaking Jews, 20,000 uh, Israelis, and about 10,000 South Africans. And that's not overly scientific, it's just uh, my math. Um, but, it, but that being said, they represent uh, a growing uh, part of our population and fortunately a growing influence on our population. And in recent years, one of the most gratifying things has been, maybe not so gratifying for the state of Israel, but the greater engagement of the Israeli community in Toronto after many years of, of uh, <coughs> disenchantment and disassociation um, their engagement in the community, particularly the last five or six years, is something, something that's very important. Another strange fact about Toronto, um, it's one of the few growing Holocaust uh, survivor communities in the world. There's 
because uh, Holocaust survivors are moving to Toronto to be with their children and grandchildren. And uh, uh, it's a very strange phenomenon. Of course, it'll be, a, unfortunately, a short-lived phenomenon. But we have a growing Holocaust survivor population. And this presents us with unique challenges and unique uh, opportunities. And uh, more facts. All of this together, the fact that uh, people are moving to Toronto, that uh, children come back even when they go away to school, makes Toronto a multi-generational city unique in North America. You have a greater than 75% chance of living in the same town as your grandchildren if you live in Toronto. That, for North America, that's an astounding uh, statistic, very different than the American experience where even if you ch your children stay in your hometown, you'll move down south to retire. Um, or, you know, it's a much more mobile community. This reflects the, the Canadian economy and, and the Canadian reality. 40% uh, of children, Jewish children in Toronto, attend a day school at one time in their lives. Uh, it slips down to, on average, at any one time, about 33-34% of kids are in day school. Uh, there, is no, there are no government subsidies for day schools in Toronto, and so despite the high cost, this represents a tremendous uh, dedication to day school education. 70% of Jews in Toronto have or will have traveled to Israel. An important statistic to know. Uh, by the way, next to New York City, Toronto youth represent the largest participatory group in Tugli birthright. Uh, only, only uh, as I said, uh, only New York City sends more kids, to, more young people to birthright than Toronto. Um, and another strange, those of you who know Toronto know its strange geography, the street called Bathurst Street that runs us the, up the center of the metropolitan area. About 80% of the Jewish population lives within one or two kilometers of Bathurst Street. So it has this, uh, it's, I say it's like having your cake and eat it too. We are a ghetto, but we're integrated with the rest of the city from north to south in a stretch some 30 kilometers, Jews are living one or two kilometers along this one street where our institutions are, where our signs are. It's a very Jewish street. Uh, uh, and it as a community, it allows us to <coughs> give us that critical mass, but at the same time, we're spread out in all the geographic areas of the city. It makes us very strong and very unique. And um, it's a very Zionistic city, increasingly so. Um, the fact that two airlines serve Toronto in direct flights to Tel Aviv, that on most days and you can go to the airport and get on a direct flight to Tel Aviv, it, there is that psychological link between Toronto and between Israel, and that's an ever-increasing factor in the psyche of the community, and I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk to that as well. So how does the Toronto Federation deal with all that? The, the beloved and the hated Toronto Federation in, in the Jewish community. Um, as I said before, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we've grown to be the third largest federation in North America from a fundraising point of view. We're not, I don't measure ourselves just by our, our fundraising achievements. They're an indication of something, not only of Toronto, but I think an indication of uh, the leadership of, of, of the community. Uh, this puts us way ahead of other communities that should be raising much more money. Uh, communities like Boston, like Los Angeles, like the Florida area. Uh, Toronto is unique in its growth. Our campaign has doubled in the last uh, 10 years, grown from around 33 million to 66 million last year. Um, and we're also in the midst of a $400 million capital campaign. Uh, we're rebuilding the infrastructure of the community. Again, sometimes we get criticized for that. Uh, we're building uh, new Jewish community centers and new, new campuses, new schools uh, throughout the greater Toronto area. Um, some of those statistics that I, that I spoke to in terms of the day school involvement, in terms of the connection with Israel, command our federation to spend its money very differently than most federations. There was a headline in the Jewish Week 
last month that said that the New York Federation is going to give, uh, for the first time, a million dollars to day school scholarships. Well, the Toronto Federation hands out $10 million each and every year for day school scholarships. $10 million. And on top of that, provides another $3 million for formal Jewish education experience. So $13 million of our budget goes to formal Jewish education. No one touches that. In fact, maybe if you added most of the federations in North America, you'd have a hard time coming up with 13, to get a group of federations that would add up to $13 million. That makes us completely unique uh, in, in the North American uh, diaspora uh, world. And then, of course, our strong ties to Israel. It's a very, a very close connection with the Jewish Agency and Karen Ayasot. A lot of our leaderships are, leadership are very involved there. Uh, that's an important part. Uh, Israel Experience, the funds we spend on sending kids to Israel Experience is a, is a real draw on, on our budget. Um, and so this colors what's available to us. So uh, there's constant battles between the I would say the Israel lobby and the education lobby, uh, but they usually tend to be the same people, so it's interesting that they, they're very schizophrenic and are always fighting with themselves uh, for our budget, but it does, uh, has shaped our budget and, and our allocations in very different ways. And before we sit down in any one allocation year, uh, you know, there's a huge, already a huge call on our budget. and. Uh, because of these um, built-in uh, loyalties, our ability to influence the social service sector probably isn't as great as most American federations. Um, and as a result, uh, over the last number of years, although there is one program we, we provide, we provide uh, two and a half million dollars in direct cash support to Jewish families on welfare. So a special arrangement with the government of Ontario we uh, supplement um, those families to allow them to live a Jewish life. And uh, on top of that, we provide housing subsidies to afford uh, families who otherwise could not to move into a Jewish neighborhood. Um, all of this is built, built on a philosoph philosophy of uh, capacity building. We leverage our dollars. We were leveraging our dollars long before it became fashionable to leverage your dollars. Uh, we always had uh, a philosophy of uh, looking for partners, looking for uh, new players, uh, partnering with the universities in terms of Jewish education needs, partnering with as many um, foundations as possible to stretch the dollars to the greatest extent we can. Uh, more and more we're becoming a proactive federation. Um, our goal is to be a leader to provide leadership to the community. We don't consider ourselves the leaders of the community, but we consider that it is our mandate to, to provide leadership where it's wanted and where it's needed. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about federations as the central address of the community. I personally uh, hate that phrase. Uh, most federations, may, because of that phrase, they tend to function as a command and control center. I like to see feder uh, I believe that uh, leadership is something you have to earn each and every day. It's not something you're entitled to. And so the philosophy, and it's right in our mission and vision statement, that the Jewish Federation of Toronto provides philanthropic, volunteer, and profes professional leadership. We don't lead. Leadership is, one, is the main product we provide. And people can use that leadership and that support to uh, help meet their dreams and aspirations. Um, another interesting factor, by the way, going back to the Israel connection, is even in the midst of the Intifada, we were sending, uh, and some of you around the table know this, we were sending more missions than ever. Um, during the Intifada, in fact, Tagleet would turn to Toronto to fill its buses when the Americans backed, uh, unfortunately the American uh, young adults backed away in those terrible days. We were sending busload after busload. It's one of the reasons why the Toronto numbers are so high there. Uh, during the Intifada, we were filling every bus we came. I don't know what, exactly what the reason is. It's not as if, it's not that we don't love our children, but uh, uh, only we don't. <laughs> it, it was always, there was always that strong connection and, what, and there wasn't that fear factor that you see uh, so often 
in the uh, American uh, communities. Uh, which leads me to um, some of the main points I'm trying to discuss. I've, I've given you a background, general, general de demographics and anecdotal advice there. Um, there is a lot, when, when you speak to, particularly when you speak to American philosophers and political scientists, we often hear that Canadian jury, Toronto jury is a generation, a generation behind uh, American jury, and uh, this is why our rates of assimilation are, are lower, this is why our connection with Israel are stronger, but just wait. In 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to face the same fate. That may have been true 15, 20 years ago, but I think there's been a fundamental change in the last 20 years, particularly the last 10 years, and um, some of it has to do with the uh, current uh, political times, some of it has to do with the generation brought up with the Intifada, and, but a lot of it has to do with uh, that people don't really recognize the difference between Canadian society and American society, and what it means to Canadian Jewry <coughs> in the coming year. Um, again, non-scientifically, my view, and I deal with my American colleagues, I've seen over the last 10 years a real drifting apart between Canadian Jewry and American Jewry. We are less and less alike. And these changes are huge, to the point where my colleagues, the executive directors of federations, when they stand up and talk, I feel an ever-widening gap in their perception of themselves as Jews and their connection to Israel <coughs> compared to the Canadian Jewish, Jewish experience. Now again, this is stereotyping and this is anecdotal, but I, I, I would have to believe that for the most part, um, American Jewry consider themselves Americans who happen to be Jewish. They're very proud of being Jewish, but we're first Americans, and as Americans, we're Jews. And we're very proud to represent the, the Jewish team here in America. Um, as Canadians, for the most part, we see ourselves as Jews who happen to be Canadians. Um, and whenever you talk to Canadian families, well, more often than not, uh, the, the, the family story is, we ended up in Canada by accident. We were really trying to go to New York, but we ended up in Halifax. So we happened to be here in Canada. But first and foremost, we're Jews. It doesn't mean we're not proud to be Canadians. We're very proud of our country, very proud of its openness. But we first and foremost consider ourselves as Jews. And I know that, uh, again, this is stereotypical. And uh, it doesn't, it, perhaps it doesn't represent some older generation of Canadians, but the newer generations do strongly at first identify themselves as Jews before they identify themselves as Canadians. Again, proud to be Canadian, no doubt about it, very proud of what their country has achieved, very proud of the openness of Canadian society to Jews, the transformation of <coughs> Canadian society in welcoming Jews from a country where none was too many to a country now that welcomes Jews and uh, with, with open, open arms is something astounding. But nonetheless, there is that sense that we're still in a foreign country. There's no, it's, it's still there, uh, to the extent that very few American Jews would ever conceive. Again, it's not a negative feeling, but there's a, a perception, an understanding. And, um, and what has evolved in the, in the last number of years, that, therefore, in Toronto, is, I think, the emergence of a new type of diaspora community, beyond the stereotypes of what uh, people would perceive a diaspora community. I would call a Zionist, the emergence of a Zionist diaspora community, a different model of what a diaspora community is. Uh, it's not a community where Jews are there and it's a place to mine for olim and mine for finances. This the Toronto Jewry increasingly <coughs> represents an outpost of the state of Israel represents an outpost of world Jewry, represents the new vision of world Jewry, with Israel at its center and strong, uh, committed urban centers of Jews, Zionist Jews, scattered around the world. Uh, there may, in the end, there may be only a dozen of them. But to me, the, 
this uh, movement, uh, the mass urbanization uh, of the world, the mass urbanization of urban Jewry, the reconnection with the state of Israel, the reconnection with the Jewish soul, despite the challenges of, um, of assimilation and no doubt, uh, ha um, have begin to create these new types of community. And I would put forward that Toronto is an example, maybe one of the newest examples, of this new type of community um, that we have to picture in terms of world Jewry and a new strategy towards dealing with Jewish peoplehood and the connection with Israel and our connection with our Jewish identity. Um, it means throwing out old stereotypes. Um, too often, diaspora communities, particularly as I read in the Israeli press, are painted as destined to collapse under the weight of assimilation and anti-Semitism. Um, too often, it's seen as um, <coughs> a place that, again, you mine for money and you mine for olim. It's the frontier of Israel, in a sense. This is where people will come from. This is where the money will come from. Uh, and vice versa, the, the Jews in the diaspora community have equally paternalistic and uh, unrealistic stereotypes of Israel. Um, but if we have an understanding that a Jewish community like Toronto, which is growing, and again, this is probably what makes us unique, we are growing, we are thriving, and in that growth and in that thriving, we are connecting more with Israel. More and more, our identity as Jews is linked to the state of Israel. Now, this is uh, it's not a new phenomenon, but it's a growing phenomenon. Um, it's not to say that um, our synagogues and our religious institutions don't have a strong pull on the community, but more and more, the greater pull is the Zionist pull. And more and more, as a federation, we feel the pressures uh, on, on that pull and how our policies have to move in that direction. Um, even in terms of our work in public advocacy, um, we made a strategic decision that as the largest Jewish community in Canada, in a relatively small country, Canada, we can punch way above our weight. That is, we have the ability as a single community to influence an important government in the world. And we made the decision five years ago that we would go about, as I said, to punch way above our weight and influence the government of Canada to change its policies towards the state of Israel. And why do we do that? Because that is the trend. We are an outpost. It's not the, uh, it, it, it's not the big conspiracy plan. It's about our connection with Jew Jewish peoplehood. We believe as a diaspora community, we can help the state of Israel by influencing the government of Israel. You know, you'll get similar experiences in Australia if you want to make a comparison to that. But that was a strategic decision on the part of our community, and we've been extremely successful. You have a, a Prime Minister of Canada and a government of Canada that make statements that I will tell you uh, don't get them any votes in the, in the ballot box. They don't even get Jewish votes, by the way. <laughs> Jews tend to still vote liberal and not vote conservative, despite the fact that the government of Canada has become very pro-Israel. I've heard Stephen Harper. The man is a Zionist at heart. He, he's the Prime Minister of Canada. He grew up story, uh, uh, with stories of Israel and, the, and how, what Israel represented to him and his grandparents. And th th this has profoundly influenced the man and has profoundly influenced his cabinet to the point where uh, one of his ministers stood up in London this week and basically <coughs> called several Air uh, organizations, the Canadian Air Federation, an anti-Semitic organization, said this in the heart of London, England. Uh, Canadian Air Federation is a powerful Muslim lobby in Canada, uh, representing a growing part of the population. And this is uh, a key minister in the government of Canada having the gumption to say such a thing. And this had to do with the influence of the Toronto Jewish community on the government of Canada as part of. Uh, a strategic plan to punch above our weight and to connect ourselves to to Israel. Zionist mythos, so many Zionist 
questions. I'll take questions. There has been a tremendous sea change in Zionism and how it relates, and in a sense, you've seen the main Zionism becoming mainstream in Toronto, uh, spread out through our school system, spread out uh, uh, through our youth movement, spread out through Israel um, experience centers. Uh, this has been a huge change in the city of Toronto. Uh, and it, every year it happens a little bit. It's, it's an imperceptible change each and every year. But when you look back 20 years, to me, this is the, the greatest change in the community. Um, so what does this mean? What, what could this all mean? To me, uh, if I was sitting in Israel and if, if I were part of the government, I don't have a lot to trade in order to get a cabinet position. You know. But if, <coughs> if I was part of the government, I would look to, this is a changing paradigm. And I can imagine if you're sitting here and you're looking out on this big, vast world, and you're saying, how do I relate to this, this diaspora? You know, roughly uh, about half, half, half the nation lives out lives outside the borders of Israel. First thing you have to understand is that that expression. Half the you have to under, believe that half the nation lives outside the borders of Israel. Uh, not everyone perceives it that way. And how do I best relate to the other half of the nation? Number one, to accept it as being part of the nation. And number two, to look at these new urban centers. You can't, you can no longer look at Canadian Jews or American Jews or British Jews or French Jews. These are models of the past. Uh, it is the urban centers that, uh, and with limited resources financially and, and uh, physically, it is choosing the right urban centers and connecting with those urban centers. And again, Maybe there are a dozen in the world. Direct connections between the government of Israel, the people of Israel, the institutions of Israel, to these mega urban Jewish centers. And building those bridges, to me, is the fastest way to, re to relink us together. That is, to create this web, an extension of the Zionist idea, Israel at the center, and spokes right to these hothouses of Judaism that exist around the world. Um, some of them are, are just beginning to rediscover their Jewish identity. Don't write off American Jewry. Don't believe the stories that they're slipping into the, the slipping into a sea of uh, assimilation. There are great, exciting things that are happening in key urban centers. We just have to relink them, particularly relink it, relink them to the state of Israel. Uh, what has happened to tr the Toronto Jewish community besides its growth, besides its great achievements financially? Uh, and you're all welcome to come there as we build these community centers and rebuild our cities. What, what is even more exciting is its connection to Israel. You know, um, the new Consul General who started in Toronto about a year ago told me that the first time he was flying back and forth on a flight from Toronto to Tel Aviv, he said it had the feeling of a commuter bus <laughs> as opposed to a, uh, uh, you know, a tourist flight. And he, he keeps on feeling, and that's what it feels like, that flight, people going back and forth, because there is this natural connection. Um, it, doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that the ties to our Jewish identity in Toronto are any less. In fact, I think they're strengthened by our connection to Israel. But it means that uh, we have to create new models of collaboration between communities like Toronto. Uh, there has to be uh, a complete sharing of cultural, educational, and that Jewish experiences between the people of Israel and communities such as Toronto. The, the land has to be extended beyond what you guys call your periphery, beyond your frontiers, into uh, the diaspora heartland. The future of the Jewish people is, is a people with, obviously, with Israel at the center and strong outposts of Judaism and Zionist ideals out there in the world feeding each other, growing from each other. We're not the hinterland. We're, we can be part of the Zionist experience, a grand extension of what the state of Israel can and should be. I'm proud of uh, being part of a uh, community such as Toronto. I'm, uh, I'm proud to be its servant as the leader of, of that federation. 
Uh, but most importantly, I'm, I'm proud of what the community stands for in terms of world Jewry. It, it's our goal to be a world leader, our goal to make the Toronto Jewish community one of the most exciting, thriving Jewish communities in the diaspora. And it's not because we want to prevent Jews. As uh, Mr. Lieberman uh, might have thought that I'm an anti-Zionist because I'm trying to prevent Aliyah. It's, it's the opposite. We're trying to encourage Aliyah, not just physical Aliyah, but Aliyah of the spirit and of the soul of the real connection to Israel to make us one My people. question is, what happened to the big changes at York University? Because I remember the period I, I was there, it was still very pro as well. Mm -hmm. University nowadays, I understand. It's quite uh, a lot of things happening against Israel. And as a matter of fact, U of T, University of Toronto, which was much more critical of Israel, has, has moved in a bit. Could you tell us something about it? Uh, yeah, well, it, it makes the international press, that's for sure. Um, well, I'm glad you mentioned U of T because, yeah, there was a drifting away of, from the, in terms of the University of Toronto. Uh, despite strong connections with the Jewish community philanthropically, educationally, and engagement-wise, there was a drifting away. So as a federation, we've been working very hard the last few years to get back into the University of Toronto to turn things around. We built a new Hello House at the University of Toronto, and uh, we're currently involved with the University of Toronto in building a brand new faculty of Jewish studies there. One of the, it'll be the largest faculty of Jewish studies in North America. and. A lot of this has to do with our re-engagement in uh, re with the University of Toronto, its leadership, and, um, and there are things you can do to turn it around. What's happening on university campuses is no different. That's what, what's happening in the world. There's asymmetrical warfare going on, and uh, particularly with York University, which is a radical, which has many radical elements leans towards the left there compared to the University of Toronto, there are a number of uh, full-time agitators, uh, uh, Palestinians who signed up for one course a year, and they flunked the course every year, uh, eight or nine of them, uh, and it, it's asymmetrical warfare because our students are students. They're full-time students. They're there to get a degree. They're there, and they, they have to focus on that. And uh, uh, it, the community, it's easy for the community to to get uh, flustered and exasperated what happens. The truth of the matter is that York University uh, administration, uh, the situation with Israel and the Jewish community is, is emblematic of what's happening elsewhere in the campus. It's, it's, it's a very uh, weak administration, o overly liberal, letting things get out of hand. They lost control of their faculty. They lost control of their teaching assistant. It was a, a strike that went on for five months. Um, and so this, this uh, laissez-faire attitude um, allows an opening, a weakness. And as soon as the strike was over, the, these radicals felt it was uh, this was the time they could, they could come out of the woodwork. We've taken steps over the last few weeks. I've met with the head of the university, a very well-meaning man, an Egyptian, Mahmoud uh, uh, Shukri, an amazing guy, but He's not up to the job there. It, it, it's going to require a lot of strength and a lot of conviction, and it's going to take time. Uh, the situation with Jews on campus is one terrible, unfortunate aspect of a great university that's heading for rough times because of poor administration. Uh, I want, I want, uh, it, it's, an, it's an example of how the community is going to respond. Uh, a lot of other organizations are grandstanding and uh, and uh, stepping forward and making all kinds of calls. The truth of the matter is, it's not that I believe that only behind the scenes work will, will work. You need to do more than that, and we've been very forced with administration. Uh, but when you're in the diaspora, you're in the diaspora, and you have to fight. You have to fight every each and every day. So it's a great example. We have problems with the University of Toronto. We tried, we solved those. Look around the corner, York University is coming in. You have to work very hard. Campuses is, is uh, it's a battleground and you need tactical warfare, and it's asymmetrical. And you have to work like the work like the enemy. You have to think asymmetrically. You can't just think traditionally. Um, if I remember, I go very often in Montreal, and I, when I meet people who 
live in Toronto, they say they moved to Toronto because of further language, uh, language problem in, in Canada, in, in Quebec, and also because naturally also, as you said, the economic situation, which is easier in Toronto, but they still miss a nice way of life that they had in Montreal. And my question is more... Well, Montreal is still an amazing Jewish community. Still amazing. Uh, my question is more regarding the press. What do you think, the, how is the press uh, relating to Israel and uh, the Hazard operation, etc.? And uh, do you think it has an effect on the political situation, the way uh, the situation is described from here? Uh, the press in Canada, um, there, uh, Really, uh, the attitude towards Israel does change from newspaper to newspaper to newspaper. I would say overall, in the last number of years, the attitude to Israel has improved on, a, on an overall basis compared to what it used to be. It got improved tremendously. Um, there's one newspaper, that, the major newspaper in Toronto, that is, has the stereotype of being anti-Israel, and that's the Toronto Star. Um, despite that, it's the most read newspaper. <laughs> by the Jews of Toronto. The, even there's one newspaper called the National Post, which is very pro-Israel, uh, leans towards the right, uh, goes out of its way to serve the Jewish community, yet Jews continue to subscribe to the paper they hate, the Toronto Star. <laughs> uh, go figure. Again, it's and hard to break. The Post is Jewishly owned. And the Post is Jewishly owned. The, the Star was too. Was it? Yeah. And there's still prominent uh, Jewish participation in the Toronto Star. That being said, it, it's easy to uh, stereotype the Toronto Star, but within the Toronto Star you'll find a growing number of pro-Israel opinions. I think the, uh, the Canadian scene is shifting more and more pro-Israel, journalistically in particular. One would have expected a torrent of anti-Israel writing during the Gaza operations. You didn't see that at all. I saw the most balanced reporting I could have imagined, uh, even coming from the Toronto Star. So I, I think it's good news. I think it uh, shows an, a maturation of the Canadian community. You know, Canadians like to consider themselves fair-minded. You know? So usually when you're fair-minded, you think there are two sides to every story. So when you get a Canadian journalist on any, on any scene, he's always looking for both sides. Um, and uh, uh, moral equivalence, you know, the equivocation is, is, is probably the rule rather than the exception for a Canadian journal journalists, but increasingly um, voices on behalf of Israel are getting stronger and stronger, and uh, uh, I think it's been a positive turnaround. Mm -hmm. Probably maybe you, you could, you've seen more changes than I have, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering to, uh, to what extent um, the global economic crisis, especially on Canada's doorstep, has impacted uh, on uh, the community, the Jewish community in particular, on your planning and your strategies, uh, on <coughs> looking more inward as opposed to focusing outward. I was very impressed by and moved by and inspired by your uh, by placing Zionism at the center of the community. It really is truly inspirational. And I was just wondering whether, in fact, what has happened globally impacts somehow on implementation of the vision and the dreams? Well, there's no doubt that uh, the global economic financial crisis hit, hit us, it hit us late. Mm -hmm. I would say there was one day in October where on a Sunday everything was looking great and by Friday the world had collapsed. That is, the, the world recession hit us in one week. In, I'm sure we were naive and we were blind, but, you know, again, anecdotally, it hit Toronto in the span of one week. The, mar the market crashed from all-time highs to all-time lows uh, within a, a two-month span, and it started on uh, one terrible week in October. Um, there's no doubt from a Jewish point of view, there's a lot of worry and angst. Uh, the Jewish community is less and, more, less, and less involved in manufacturing, uh, more involved in services, financial services. Uh, it has a psych at, at the very least, it has a psychological impact, and there's great concern. But there's genuine optimism, nonetheless. There's a sense that the 
worst in hit Canada, that our financial institutions are stronger than others. Again, it may be proved that we're naive all over again, but um, there's cautious optimism that we'll get out of it. Um, it didn't affect our campaign to the extent it might have. It might affect it next year. Our capital campaign <coughs> might be slowed down a little bit while we're still, we're going to be in the enviable situation starting, that we're in the midst of, a constru of construction right now. We're in the Enville situation of we're going to start construction in the next few months, so we'll be building in the middle of a recession. We hope this keeps a spirit of optimism in the community. In terms of our, our Zionist connection, we'll also be in the Enville uh, situation. Again, I hate just to talk about capital projects, but they happen to be you know, symbolic in some ways. We're going to be involved in uh, two major capital projects in the next few months in a lot. Uh, the, uh, we're building dorms for the Ben University campus down in Ela, and we'll be uh, with a major partner behind the new emergency ward at Yosefel Hospital. Again, these are funds that were raised before the recession, and we have the good fortune of being able to lead partnerships now. But again, we hope this is is a morale boost during some difficult times. Uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, the recession has dampened the, the heights of Jewish community, I would say far less so in Canada than the States. Uh, the boom that fell on the American community is just gigantic. Judge Bach and then Paul Weisman. Uh, have there been any reactions in Canada as to what happened in England, you know, with the boycott of Israeli uh, Also, I, I mean, are there Jewish schools there, or are there, or are there uh, courses that teaching Hebrew, and are there Jewish youth movements, and so to what, to what extent are they, uh, are they active and, so, and felt in Jewish life? Well, certainly what's happened in England is uh, there are some university campuses in Canada that have tried to emulate it. They, they have been defeated uh, each time, and we've been very cognizant of that. Um, there was a delegation of uh, university presidents that came to Israel last year on a, on a trip that we and other Canadian federations helped organize, and I think that was an important trip. Uh, again, you have to be ever mindful. You have to be. You have to guard the gates each time. Um, if you don't work hard, this is a trend that, that could turn around to a negative side, and yeah, it's something that you do have to wor worry about. The university campus, our loss on the in the left of center, um, our engagement and lack of engagement, more importantly, in the left of center over the last generation, is is uh, a great it's a great peril to the Jewish people. Um, I don't know the right answer. It's going to take time, but we have to reinsert ourselves into the dialogue on the left the left of center. You have to understand that there is a valid and important Jewish engagement in the left of center argument. And, uh, and there are uh, leadership, uh, intellectual leaders in the left of center who understand uh, that we have to align themselves more and more with them and we have, to, we have to overcome stereotypes and we have to work with them, particularly on the university campuses. In terms of uh, there's growing number of Jewish study courses at uh, universities. York University in particular has a great faculty of Jewish studies and trains some fine uh, Jewish teachers. And uh, we rely on York University as a major uh, support in our education system. Again, there are 11,000 Jewish students, day school students in Toronto. Uh, and uh, York University and, and I believe University of Toronto increasingly will be an important part of that. And, and the study of Hebrew is a growing phenomenon on u university campuses across Canada. Um, more and more colleges are offering Hebrew as a, as a course for study. Again, if we're proactive, uh, and we have to be proactive, uh, I, I think we will succeed. Howard and Ben and Ben Thank you, Manfred. Okay, an excellent presentation.
Toronto, and, and also projection of what a new paradigm in Israel diaspora world Jewish relations might be. My question um, is a lot to talk about, but a um, little, little more specifically, as you relate or compare Canadian Jewry with American Jewry, to what extent are these kinds of issues, as you, you presented today, uh, dialogued at all at UJC meetings, when you're together with leadership <coughs> from the United States, either professionally or lay and professional? And I guess the follow-up question is, did you, did you happen to attend the UJC meetings in Florida? And might you give us a brief report on that, particularly as it relates to the discussion in the press regarding UJC and Jewish agency, JBC relationship? You know, I, I would, uh, this is not being as respectful to my colleagues as it should be, but um, I have found over the years that it's uh, more and more difficult to speak with my American colleagues and to actually have them hear me. For most American Jewish leadership, it's just quaint that there are Jews outside the United States. It's just quaint. Isn't that interesting? There are Jews in Canada. Isn't that, there's Jews in Mexico. Isn't that interesting? They have lost their moral compass when it comes to Jew Jewish peoplehood. They they are great Zionists, but they they have they they are, they have been caught up in um, in the spirit of Americanism and uh, and have lost sight of a true sense of Jewish peoplehood. And, um, you know, study after study comes out uh, about the success of the Toronto Jewish community. Len Sachs uh, is printing a, sending out a report on the tremendous success and the model of the, the Toronto model for birthright follow-up. You know, uh, we, we participated, we agreed to participate in a study comparing the impact of birthright and the, and the birthright follow-up systems uh, in seven major North American communities. Toronto outstripped, Toronto's model outstripped all of them. Uh, but when Amer confronted with these statistics, Americans give that old story, well, they're a generation behind. It doesn't apply to them. Well, truth of the matter, it does apply to them. They, they're they cold to ideas from outside the country. They're not open to them. It's very hard. Uh, even Michael Steinhardt himself, who I have this argument often, says, it's a different gene pool, you know. <laughs> it won't apply to American Jewry. It's they can't believe that someone may be doing something that from which they can learn. They have a very difficult time understanding and believing it. So it's very, very frustrating. I have great fears about the future of American Jewry. Tremendous fears. And one of those fears is the the absolute lack of leadership coming from UJC. I um, I hope that leadership may come elsewhere, or I hope that UJ, UJC, not Jewish communities, it's interesting, they, they use that word UJC, I'm caught in, they, they came up with a wonderful new name, United Jewish Communities, and they slipped it down to, to an acronym, UJC, United Jewish Communities, it, it is a wonderful word, they should, they should use it a lot. No one, American Red Cross doesn't call themselves the ARC, the Salvation Army doesn't call themselves the SA, but United Jewish Communities says, United Jewish Community, the UJC. Uh, it's not united, it's less and less Jewish, and it certainly isn't a community. <laughs> and uh, it has a long way to go. I'm, hope, I'm hoping, and I do believe that when new leadership emerges, they will be able to uh, turn things around, because that's where the strength of the community comes. In terms of the meetings in Florida, I was there. I was the lone Canadian there. Um, uh, there was a, a tremendous misunderstanding about what was what was talked about before the conference. Again, this is another example of United Jewish Communities fumbling the ball, doing a terrible job of stewarding the relationship between the Jewish Agency and JDC and American Federations. The truth of the matter is that nothing changed. Uh, this they were just articulating a practice that ex existed in a generation. That is, the JDC and Jaffe 
it's been a long time, if ever, that they've had a monopoly on the, on the call of money from uh, North American communities. They have the lion's share and always and, and will for the foreseeable community, especially from the federations that count. Uh, but when you put something down on paper, which they were trying to do, it's 10 years since the merger, so they decided to actually articulate things on paper, it came out all the wrong way. And it's because UJC fumbled the ball, let, you know, instead of turning down the temperature, raise the temperature. Uh, and um, I believe if they get the horse back in the barn, maybe uh, things will be uh, cool again. Again, and now I'm speaking to JDC and Jaffe, the same approach I'm suggesting to the, uh, that the government of Israel should have to war jury, they should be having towards the diaspora jury. Go to the important communities. Forget the national organizations, because they don't represent much anymore. The strength increasing will be in those 12 urban centers. Connect with them. Don't waste too much energy trying to go through antiquated national organizations that represent American Jewry of two or three generations ago. Don't forget, you, an American Jewry that used to be spread out in 50 states, uh, so much more evenly. Now they're concentrated in a small number of urban areas, and these national organizations are clinging to life. Uh, represent, and the, again, they, they're antiquated national organizations that need renewal because the biggest change is the rapid urbanization of the Jewish community and the national organizations mean less and less and less in that, in that world. And that's the dissonance you're getting here, is that when an organization, organization like, like Jaffe tries to go through uh, UJC to reach American Jewry, they're not reaching American Jewry, and they never will. Um, and David and then Listening to you, came to my mind a, a joke the one went around in Israel that uh, Moses, because of, of his uh, yes. uh, failure, language failure, uh, went to Canaan instead of going to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I once, you know, we're, we're taught as kids that the native, native communities of, uh, of North America cross the land bridge between Alaska and Siberia, you know, at one time. It's, you know, there, the yes. similar parallel story. Yeah. But, only, but my question is, is not a joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I was concert general in Montreal in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. The heyday of Montreal. And at that time, uh, Montreal uh, was the center of Canadian Jewry. Uh, it deteriorated after Quebec Became the French uh, French community because of policy in Canada. <coughs> what is it? What is it, the position today of the Montreal community, the community, Jewish community in Quebec? Mm -hmm. I know it's not it's outside your lecture, but I just think would be interesting. Well, as I said earlier, it's an amazing Jewish community, raising tremendous, proportionally higher amounts of money than Toronto does. Uh, has great leadership. Their greatest gift <laughs> to Canadian Jewry has, has been generations of, that have moved to Toronto. Uh, <laughs> a disproportionate number of my leadership comes from Montreal. Mm -hmm. The Montreal Jewish community taught people how to be leaders, Natu became natural leaders. Um, it's a demographic time bomb that the Jewish community of Montreal is facing. Um, the, uh, it's not just the, the 25,000 or 30,000 that left, it's their children and grandchildren that are all growing up now in Toronto and haven't been replaced in Montreal. Immigrants aren't, Jewish immigrants aren't moving to Montreal, so it, it's on a steep decline. Um, the demographics will start kicking in in another 10 years and then, uh, you know, it, 70% of the community will be, I mean, over half the community will be Haredi in, in, in another uh, 10, 15 years. Huge change. Um, 
uh, it's uh, they're facing tremendous <coughs> financial crisis right as we speak. Um, it's just a ticking demographic time bomb, and it's a shame. Um, a lot of it. Uh, but that being said, it's an amazing Jewish community. I think they may come out of it. As I spoke to, it's a matter of mindset. Uh, some of the leadership are finally just now getting to the realization they're not the community they were in the 70s. And before they tried to be, they tried to keep up with Toronto and with the major, with the New Yorks and LA. And now they realize, you know what, maybe we should be a Cleveland. Maybe we should be a strong mid-sized community. That's our role model. And I think if they focus that way, there is success there. But again, the demographics are overwhelming. It's hard to fight, and and it's a, there's a time delay because the generation that did, those who did stay for economic reasons or other reasons, they're getting old, and their kids have left. Well, the community, which is rising. Yes, Jonathan. First of all, thank you for being there. You you're inspiring us. As somebody sitting on this end, two questions, two areas. One is, you've already hooked me. If you throw out one more time the 12 urban centers of the future, you got to list them. All I hear is so Toronto. <laughs> we have to give your, have your list, what, how you see it from your perspective. And secondly, the question about the role of Zionism um, as providing a kind of uh, focus, ethical, moral, Jewish focus for diaspora communities. There is a deep internal debate going on in Israel now, and we're asking ourselves what is Israel supposed to provide ourselves in terms of a focus? Um, this will not come as a shock to you because you round a lot, but uh, the word Zionism in Israel isn't always the most positive. Sometimes it can be, it can be a throwaway phrase. So uh, I'm just saying that there's a, there's, you've given, I think, us an internal challenge. So I'm curious, really, in your sense, when you use the phrase Zionism in Israel, what, what do you look to the land and the state of Israel to provide you, maybe you'll help us see ourselves even better than we can see ourselves. My definition is Zionism. Uh, and the 12 cities. <laughs> In terms of the 12 cities, uh, I, people might have you know, a bigger list, but you, you, you may know them more than I. You know what, I will look to Boston and New York and LA and uh, Miami and Southern Florida and Atlanta, and of course London, England, and Melbourne, and Australia, yes, Paris, Buenos Aires. People would know that it won't take long to do that assessment. There are tremendous, wonderful things happening in those communities, and we have to link those. And there may be more than 12. I just wrote 12 because they're top of mind. Uh, but I think that that is, those are the links that we have to look for. And uh, we have to, it's a period of, um, there may be, in order to do this, we ha there has to be a focus on disintermediation, that is, going around the national structures of those getting, uh, moving them aside. What was that word? Disintermediation. <laughs> you don't use it often. <laughs> no, I, I, actually I use it one of my, I think Manfred heard me use that. It's, it's, a, it's a common, it's a global trend, disintermediation. You go right, uh, going through traditional uh, interlaced bodies. <coughs> Um, so, I, you know, I clearly, uh, I, again, this is not going to sound very deep, but, you know, when it, in terms of um, a Zionistic view of, of, of the Jewish world, uh, it's a clear understanding that Israel is the center of the Jewish world, and our desire to build a state here, a, a full and meaningful state, a Jewish state, it is, is the task of, of the Jewish people. and. Uh, we in the diaspora have to participate fully in that job, and vice versa. Those in the state of Israel have to work with the with diaspora communities and, and invest in those diaspora communities so they can be part of the fuller Jewish people. Um, I think that's really important. I, I, I predict that in uh, within a generation, you're going to see the government of Israel investing directly in Jewish education in, uh, in these urban centers uh, um, that birthright was just the beginning of an investment in diaspora youth that uh, an important part of your tax dollars 
will be going to educate the Aspera children. Sarah Basel. First of all, thank you. Um, I would like to ask about uh, the streams of Judaism in Toronto, Orthodox, Conservative. Who is a Jew in Toronto? Who do you expect to uh, uh, accept to the day schools? On, on which basis? And the conversion issue, is there a bait in in Toronto? Uh, there is a bait in in Toronto. It's not recognized mm -hmm. everywhere as, as well it should. I would say in Toronto, the reform and orthodox movements are becoming increasingly stronger and the, and the conservative movement unfortunately is losing strength and direction. Um, the participation of uh, the reform community in Zionist life is a huge growth in the last uh, several generations and, and along with that the participation of the reform community in day schools, right up to the high school levels, has been the growth has been phenomenal, uh, and uh, I think that represents a, a growing strength of the community. Um, um, I would like to see there, there there should be, and I hope there would be, uh, a growing number of the modern Orthodox members of the Toronto Jewish community. Um, one of the unfortunate uh, situations of the last few generations was the arrival of the Reichman family in Toronto and the people that they brought with them aren't very community minded and uh, have created rifts in the Jewish community that may not have been there before. Uh, and there's, there's too, ma too much of the, the divisiveness and not enough of uh, pulling together there. I'd, I'd like to see the, the draw is the Zionist draw. Uh, the strength more and more is in uh, modern Orthodox and the Reform community. I, I wish the conservative movement would pick itself up by its bootstraps and and regain its strength, but I, um, I don't see that happening. Uh, we always go to nine questions, so we have arrived there. The final question, Dr. Stephen Dolce. I, I found uh, your presentation uh, very refreshing in its openness and directness. But um, what I'm curious about is that there are a lot of challenges that you identified in terms of the comments you made. Challenges to UJC, challenges to concepts of community, Jewish identity. I'm wondering, Ted, in your um, wanderings, do you have any chance to sit down with your colleagues and not only to sit and you know wonder about the way they're perceiving things, but actually dialogue with them so that in addition to this you know becoming a kind of critique or perception, that it actually has the possibility of motivating some stimulating dialogue or discussion with them? Because there are some of the people, I think, uh, in the American community who would respond um, to the challenge of such a discussion, and some people even within the, the federation system itself who don't necessarily agree, you know, uh, with uh, what's coming out of it. Um, yeah, there are tremendous leaders in the, in the federation system. Uh, I have huge respect for John Roskay. I think he is a great voice of uh, a vision and understanding, and he and I have spoken about this many times, and I believe there can be a turnaround. Um, I'm currently working with a group of, uh, we put together an informal forum of Federation executive directors and senior uh, leaders of Jewish, professional leaders of Jewish foundations, and we meet uh, twice a year, and uh, we're just trying to solidify that association. And I think um, that's a great sign for the future where the foundation world and the federation world are finally coming together again. And a great new camaraderie has been struck between major foundation professionals and major federation professionals. And some great stuff is coming out of it. So I co-chair that forum with Sandy Carden from the Schusterman Foundation. And uh, we 
currently each of us, um, each of the foundations and each of the federations have chipped in $10,000 each to create a new organization, uh, rather informal. So uh, we have we all provided seed money to create a new, again, paradigm of how the Jewish community could operate.